Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. All right, Macro Musing listeners, we're back. Noah Smith has been gracious enough to give us a bonus segment this week. So, Noah, thank you for sticking around for an extra segment. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yes, it's great to have you on. Now, I wanted to get on macroeconomics with you in the main program, but we ran out of time. But you, again, have graciously agreed to stay on. And you've written several posts recently that were very interesting. And, you know, this is where I, I kind of cut my teeth is in macroeconomics. And you've written a lot on this over the years, your original blog, you, you wrote about macro, of course, back then, in that, that time, that was the thing to write about macro and why we have the slow recovery. But you had an article titled macroeconomics is still in its infancy. And you you spent a lot of time on Ed Prescott, real business cycle models, DSGE models. What was the argument you were making in that piece? Well, I think we had this big explosion of macro theory in the 80s. Everything changed. You know, we went from these pretty simple models to what we now call DSGE models, which were the first DSGE model was Prescott and Kidlin's original classic RBC model. And then that was a big methodological revolution. And I think it became pretty clear early on that the actual models that Prescott was making were not very good in terms of their ability to fit whatever small scant data we had. And in terms of just making sense, they didn't make any sense and they didn't work very well. And the sort of quasi-empirical justifications that Prescott and company had put out for them, you know, oh, look, we can replicate a time series that sort of has the same volatility as like the real time. It was not convincing. It wouldn't convince any like you know, serious econometrician. You had to sort of hold your nose to think that this justified these models in any way. And so I think that Prescott got a Nobel not because he got things right about how the economy worked. You know, recessions aren't due to like engineers forgetting how to do things. Well, I do think engineers sometimes forget how to do things, but I don't think they forget on that short of time scale. It's not due to that. And so really that, that just didn't make any sense. The reason Ed Prescott won a Nobel was because that methodology, that mathematical methodology seemed to satisfy, satisfied people's desire to, you know, address these theoretical critiques, the Lucas critique and whatever, whatnot in ways that made them enduringly popular. So, so after that, people kept making DSG models. Even after people decided RBC wasn't the right model for the economy, they made new Keynesian models and other types of models. So you even had some models in the RBC tradition, like new shock models or whatever, like Angelitos is working on, you know, at the like, you know, multi-producer, multi-sector models or whatever. So you had lots of RBC inspired models, but mostly you had new Keynesian models. That's what took over. That's the workhorse of macro, yep. Right, and so... That's like a potted history of macro in the last few decades. New Keynesian models, of course, had to receive a major update after the Great Recession, financial crisis. Basically, people added financial sector and added a zero lower bound. We know that monetary policy only, conventional monetary policy only goes so far. And there's reasons to think why unconventional monetary policy is in some sense weaker. You know, Mike Woodford did a lot on this. And so we're like, okay, so we need to do some fiscal stimulus when we hit the zero lower bound. That became a big deal. And then I know you've you've written massive amounts about this. So of course, all your readers and, and listeners are, are familiar with this stuff. And the other thing was, you know, obviously finance can crash the economy. Whoa, who knew? And so then who could have predicted? And so, you know, based on the Great Depression or Japan or Sweden or any of these things, right? It was obvious finance can crash the real economy, but only recently have people started trying to shoehorn that into the new Keynesian models that had prevailed. So those are the two big things that people updated, but still people basically used DSGE models and basically used new Keynesian models because new Keynesian models are all about the role of monetary policy. And so that became very influential at central banks. But I still think it's tempting to see this as a great march of progress, but I think that I'm much more of a pessimist about this. First of all, because the whole idea of using DSG models in the first place was that these models were supposed to provide credible micro foundations for macro behavior. And the, the micro foundations of DSGE, of, of new Keynesian DSGE models, and the micro foundations of the original RBC models don't generally make a lot of sense. When we start looking at these micro foundations in the micro data, it doesn't seem to fit. So for example, Euler equations, the consumption Euler equation, basically the idea that if like, you know, if interest rates are high, you'll, I don't know, save more money, whatever. The idea that basically like 
you know, consumption decisions are based intertemporally based on interest rates intertemporally. Yeah. yeah. When you look at the actual data on this, it looks like the exact opposite of what Euler equations would predict. It's not just it's not just that you can't find a signal. It's not just a weak signal. It's the exact opposite. It flips the sign. Eichenbaum, you know, who's one of the main New Keynesian DSG modelers, was the guy who told me about this. He said it using profanity that I will not repeat on this podcast. That is how he described the Euler equation that is at the core of his own models that have made his career. That is scientific honesty, I think. And it is a scientific honesty that many, you know, sort of shallower boosters of the research literature lack. So my idea comes from Eichenbaum. The macro is in its infancy. Okay, and, and he's a big name. He's a big name, yeah. He's a huge name. Now, but let me ask this question then. So you're talking about the Euler equation and kind of like the, the workhorse standard New Keynesian model. Right. Calvo pricing. Yeah, sticky prices and all Do that. Do you really think that macroeconomic fluctuations are determined by a ferry that tells you when you're allowed to change your price? Like, no. No, it's an approximation. It's a shortcut. But let me ask this question about this. So, Right, but not a structural one. Right. No, the no, structural that's, that's shortcut fair. would describe how people change their prices in response to actual events. And people have tried to make those models. This has been fair. There, there's been endogenous, you know, price setting oh, tons. behavior. Right. It's just really hard. It's very hard. I guess that's that's two comments I want to make. Number one, I think one contribution, you know, that Prescott did make is just really emphasizing general equilibrium. And you note this in your article, right? That's an important consideration when you're thinking, you know, what's the general equilibrium effect? You got to consider all the pieces moving together, not just some kind of, you know, isolated Ceres Paribus argument. The other thing, though, is one could argue there has been some progress. So the models you mentioned, the representative agent, New Keynesian model, you have that one Euler equation, but you know the work on the new heterogeneous agent, New Keynesian. So you have different types of households. You have, you know, poor, hand-to-mouth, even rich, someone who who gets a lot of money, but they just live paycheck to paycheck. And when you get these different types of households, you might find Euler equations that make more sense. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on the Hank models, the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian models? And for those who, who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, but DSGE is dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. But do you find those a productive endeavor? Are we Are we making progress using Hank models? Well, I mean, it's a good thing to try out. I had to do heterogeneous agent models for my class. I know that there's a lot of mystery meat in the way you get those things to converge. There's no real proof of existence of solutions for like a Grussell Smith kind of model. And that's like the most simple possible like heterogeneous agent RBC model that you can make. And so now you bring in imperfect competition and blah, blah, blah. It's just, you know, increases the parameter space. And so the answer is that these models may be a good exercise, but you can't validate these things with data. And to validate these things with data, you've got to really push the boundaries of what's credible mathematically. A lot of times you have mystery meat code that ends up converging to something and saying, look at this result we get. And I don't have confidence in that result because I know how you change one little assumption about like, you know, how approximate aggregation works in, in this value function iteration kind of thing. You can also solve them with finite element method. I'm sure people have actually improved the solution methods a lot in the last decade. So I'm sure the solution methods of work improved although I don't think they've gotten an actual existence proof for these things. But these technical details all come down to the fact that we don't have a lot of macroeconomic data. We have only a few decades of macroeconomic data. You know, the series are all correlated with each other. And the international series are correlated too. And everything's serially correlated. So you've got massive, massive, massive amounts of correlation in a sparse data set. How are you going to validate these models? Like, I'm pessimistic about the top-down DSGE project. And I think that people need to actually think back to the Lucas critique and think, if you have the wrong micro foundations, do you have any confidence that putting these things together in a big tinker toy model will give you the right answers when you're starting with small wrong answers? Will small wrong answers add up to a big right answer? And Lucas critique would suggest no. Like if you don't know how micro agents work, if you don't know how companies decide when to invest, if you don't know how and consumers decide to consume and all these things like this, if you don't know these things, if you don't have a very good idea of how those micro processes work, can you trust a macro model that seems to fit aggregate data or at least the small amount of aggregate data we have? Should you trust that the results of the macro model will be structural, will be robust to policy changes? And the Lucas critique answer is no. And I feel like we've moved away from the Lucas critique answer of, well, no, then you shouldn't trust it, to the Milton Friedman pool player analogy of who cares what goes into the salad as long as it tastes like salad, 
you know, the mystery meat is okay kind of thing. Or like, who cares what goes into the Long Island iced tea as long as it tastes like an iced tea? Maybe you should care. But then that pool player analogy, which for the listeners, the analogy is a pool player doesn't know the physics of how they hit the pool ball. They just do it and it comes out right. And that's sort of an expression for as long as we fit the macro data, we don't need to fit the micro data. But the Lucas critique says the exact opposite. It says that we need credible micro foundations or else our macro results may be good at curve fitting on past data series, but they won't be structural, they won't be predictive. And so I think that macroeconomists need to revisit that idea, to revisit Lucas and to aim lower. And, and many are doing this. I think young macroeconomists are mostly doing so this. So what would be an example of that? What do you want them to do? Like aim lower in what way? Try to figure out how the pieces of the economy work. So there's been a lot of work on consumption in response to plausibly exogenous policy shifts. So for example, you have unemployment insurance gets extended, and then extended UE gets cut off. How do people respond to that? And how do heterogeneous classes of people respond to that? That was some work during the Great Recession that I thought, this is great. I'm really glad that people are doing this. Or you have like clean house paper, like how different classes of companies responded to, you know, the Great Recession, how they changed employment differently depending on things. And so this can help you build up like search theoretic models of the labor market. And so it's just these very, these small bore things that don't satisfy the Ed Prescottian desire for grand hand-waving solutions, theories of everything. But they're more of what I'd call normal science. They're building up small pieces of knowledge that someday we will aggregate. And this is what I say when I mean macroeconomics is in its infancy. And I think this is a thing that most, not all, but most young macroeconomists would agree with me these days about, especially because I, you know, before COVID, at least I would talk to them a lot at conferences and whatever. And people would tell me they agreed with this. When they showed me what they're working on, it's very, it's very humble stuff, just designed to glean facts about consumption and employment and investment and all these things. I think investment's the most understudied category, by the way, like knowing what makes companies invest is like insanely understudied because we have such good data on corporations and so many plausibly exogenous government policy shifts and so little like understanding of what drives investment. Anyway, that's a tangent. But I think using the techniques of, of empirical economics to understand the micro behaviors that add up, including finance, including bubbles, including bank collapses, including debt, like are there really balance sheet recessions? That question depends on whether or not people have these sort of mental modes of deleveraging that they shift into. That's Richard Koo's hypothesis. And so you can test that. You don't have to just throw that assumption into a big meat grinder and see if you match the macro data. You can test the micro assumptions. You can go look at like how policy changes that have an exogenous cutoff where they cut off the debt they forgive. They forgive this person's debt. They don't forgive this other similar person's debt. You see how they change things. You can see like, you know, debt forgiveness or you can see these things. You can observe these things. So let me provide some pushback. I think this is what a macro economist would say. They would agree, yeah, we do need to look at the, the building pieces, you know, better understand those parts much more thoroughly, investment, consumption, things like that. But the danger is if you look and you're too narrow in your focus, you may overlook the fact that there's still general equilibrium effects going on. You might find a really robust finding in you know certain types of businesses, but how do they respond in the midst of a, of a recession, a, a global slowdown? The empirical work is, is really subject to this general equilibrium critique. You can't just assume up that everything's going to approximate and be the same. Well, no. So, so there's a couple of responses to that. So first of all, when you do the micro studies showing how people respond to say like the end of extended unemployment insurance, the consumption response to that, right? You do a micro study about that. You know that everybody's in the same macroeconomic situation of the great recession, right? So you haven't gotten a final answer to the question of how people behave in response to this kind of thing. You've only got a conditional answer to how people respond individually in the context of a larger general equilibrium environment right? So you're not done. It's just a start. So then you have to look at other macroeconomic environments. You have to look at, you know, the great moderation era and other policies that did things. So basically you have to build up an understanding of consumption behavior by looking at various sort of regimes of recessions and booms and stability and inflation, deflation, all these things to get a more plausible picture of the microeconomics of consumption. And then when you take those pieces and once you're really confident of those pieces, you can start adding them in to DSGE type models and they may look ugly. A consumption Euler equation looks really nice. Elegant. Yeah. Yes. It's super elegant. But I think we've passed well beyond the point where we expect elegance from DSGE models at all. Like Hank models are just a giant tinker toy nightmares. 
and we're okay with that. We, you know, we accept that. And so the point is that, yes, it's going to look nightmarish when we get all these realistic models of consumption and investment and all these things. Once we get those realistic micro foundations, not Prescott sprinkles fairy dust on his favorite fable micro foundations, but actual real micro foundations that are probably going to have behavioral effects. They're going to be complex. They're going to be situational. They're going to have like a lot of hard to estimate things. And when we get those things and we, we start building back up again, it's going to look ugly as heck. Right? It's going to look really ugly, but that's just the way it is because that's the complexity of the system we're dealing with. And if we're going to pretend that that super complex system is actually a super simple system, you might as well do it with just like a couple lines on a graph rather than, you know, like a Prescott model. Like as long as we're pretending things are simple, we can, you know, we might as well use lines on a graph. And you do this all the time, right? You prefer lines on a graph to whipping out the old DSGE model and calibrating it. For a very good reason, which is that as long as we're in the realm of like simplistic, heuristic, directionally correct kind of, you know, stuff, then we might as well use models where the inputs and outputs are very, very simple rather than hard stuff. And if we're going to make a model that we have more confidence in, a structural model, a real micro-founded structural model with good micro-foundations that we have more confidence in than the couple of lines on a graph, it's going to be ugly as heck and we shouldn't worry about that, and we should just try to get it right, and we might not be able to get it right for 50 or 80 years. But you know what? That's how science works, and there's still a lot of natural science we don't know, and it's hubris to assume that because I can write down some equations, you know, for something that I understand it. Okay, so let's take Noah Smith and put him in charge of the Fed. All right, you're the okay. chair. I'm the chair. What type of model would you use? So on a practical level, so you, you don't have much confidence in a Hank model, some of the other DSGE models. So what do you use? Just you're, you're trying to fill your way through the economy. Let's say you're chair right now and trying to figure out how much of the inflation you should respond to. Some of it's supply driven, some of it's demand driven. What do you do? What, what framework can you rely upon to give you some meaningful advice? I have a very good answer to this. It comes from Tetlock. Tetlock's examination of forecasters and who wins at forecasting. Now, I know the Fed does a lot more than just forecast. They have to look at conditional policy responses and other kinds of things. They do much more than forecast, but when Tetlock looks at who succeeds and who fails, the people with the one big theory fail and the people who glean a lot of little bits of information from a lot of different paradigms, whom he calls foxes, though he didn't invent the term, he called the single theory people hedgehogs. I forget who actually invented this term. It's some older writer. But then, but then he calls the eclectic people foxes, and the foxes always win the forecasting competition. And so I think that although Fed policymaking isn't just forecasting, there's an element of forecasting, but there's lots of other elements too, I would say that they should be foxes. And in fact, this is exactly what they do. When you talk to Fed people, you quickly understand this is exactly what they're doing. So you should make the models that are a couple of lines on paper. You should have some like nerds who know how to run some big DSGE models, including like Smets Wouter's model augmented with like a financial sector and a zero lower bound. You should have those people who know how to run that model Right in the right, right. somewhere in your bureau. I'm not saying that's the greatest model in the world, but I'm saying that you should have that somewhere. You should have your little like FRB US, basically like giant spreadsheet with unrealistic uh, assumptions of correlations between things. You should have your VARs. You should have your SVARs. Somewhere you should have some people running some SVARs. Run like several different SVARs, and then you should have your like you know green book sort of business conditions tell me this, reading the tea leaves sort of people, right? And you have all these different sources of thoughts and modeling information, and then you debate it out amongst yourselves and see whether the sources agree or whether they disagree, and try to understand why you might trust one over the other in a certain situation, and then think about it a lot, and then use discretion. Okay. So I'm sorry, rules versus discretion people. Again, Prescott, John Taylor, I'm sorry, you guys. Discretion versus rules is not up to our discretion. The rule is that you must always use discretion because there's papers showing this, by the way, showing that lack of you know ability to signal credibility, you'll always be using discretion because people will just assume you are. And so there's papers about this. And then if all else fails, just ask Emi Nakamura what to do. Okay, we will do that. All right, no, we've gone through mainstream macro. We see there's plenty of opportunity for growth and improvement. So we will take the challenge, Noah, and, and plot ahead and do our part to make this world a better place. Advancing science, one economist at a time. All right, but uh -uh. Let's, let's turn to something that you've also written on beyond mainstream macro. And this is an article titled, Nutty Macroeconomic Theories Will Ruin Your Economy. So talk us through these other nutty macro theories. Right. So the most famous nutty macroeconomic theory that everyone loves to pick on with justifiably is called MMT and is this sort of made up 
thing that's not really a theory because it's, it's like a, a gang of people who are extremely aggressive online and extremely good at sort of finding new journalists and politicians to listen to them for a little while before the new journalists and politicians realize, wait a second, I'm talking to crazy people. But often then it's too late and you've written your glowing New York Times profile of like the MMT people. And they're just absolute horrible people if you meet them. They're just like real pieces of work, but their ideas are not just nutty, but vague. So they'll never write down their theory. You know, there's no theory, and they'll never admit their theory ever having made a single wrong prediction, which is how you know there's no actual theory. Because if there's an actual theory, no theory ever gets everything 100% right. Sorry, standard model of physics, uh, maybe. But like, no, no theory we know ever gets everything right. And so if you never get anything wrong, you don't actually have a theory. So it's an unfalsifiable theory. It's not unfalsifiable. It's, it is non-existent. Yes, it's unfalsifiable because you can't write it down. <laughs> it's like my theory is that burr, 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 they're going to hurt her. Now take my recommendation of always borrowing more money. And that is the best summary of MMT I can give. And so MMT people will just like, you know, tie themselves in knots. It's like a non-economist's imagination of what economists do with no actual relation to what actual economists do. Once in a while, they slip up and they say an actual substantive thing. And this is when you catch them. And so like, if you don't know how to recognize this BS, then you, you catch the BS when they sometimes slip up and say a very specific thing. So there's an exchange between Stephanie Kelton, one of the main MMT proponents, and Jason Furman, you know, former White House you know, economic advisor under Obama, when Stephanie Kelton says, have you considered the possibility that raising interest rates might actually make inflation worse or something like that? And Furman just replies, no. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, famous tweet. Right, and so he just says no. And that's good because, you know, some macroeconomists have considered this. And they're called the neo fisherians So back in like the, the days of quantitative easing, people who didn't like quantitative easing were trying to say, oh, actually, these low interest rates are going to bring us into deflation, and that's why we shouldn't like them. I don't think they ever really believed it. They were just toying around with the idea, possibly for political purposes, but also just for fun, because that's, you know, that's what macroeconomists get paid to do. That's what the model says. That's what the model says. And so you had these people, you know, I, I think that Schmidt, Grohe, and Uribe were, they sort of like did entertain the real concept. And, but then like John Cochran was probably just trolling. Stephen Williamson's another one. Stephen Williamson doesn't know whether he's being serious or trolling because he's Canadian. And <laughs> being Canadian means... You exist in a quantum superposition of seriousness and sarcasm. And that's Steve Williamson. But anyway, here's the point. They tried it. Erdogan tried it in Turkey. And Erdogan really, really got this very, very strong idea that lower interest rates will make inflation lower and higher interest rates will make inflation higher. So in response to spiraling inflation, he continues to keep interest rates low based on, you know, he didn't read neo fisherian theories or papers, and he didn't listen to the MMT people either, but he just came up with the same silly idea on his own, and it's currently... Turkey is just spiraling into hyperinflation because guess what? That's not how things work. And so these nutty ideas, and you have other nutty ideas. I consider Austrianism to be another one of these nutty ideas. I know lots of people like it, but certainly the version of Austrianism that relies on praxeology, which is just like that meme where they say, source, I made it up. That's basically praxeology. And so there's these other nutty ideas floating around. And when you see them actually tried, they blow up economies really badly. Yes, macroeconomists, they haven't nailed down the facts about how things work quite yet, but the heuristics they've developed, these little, you know, couple lines on a graph will easily beat whatever Stephanie Kelton is serving up, right? Like couple lines on a graph, like ISLM will outperform Stephanie Kelton every time. Like you just follow Stephanie Kelton's advice, you'll just blow up your economy. And then Stephanie Kelton will say, well, of course, MMT got this right too, because remember, they always take a victory lap no matter what happens they'll wave away and qualify their tweets when they slipped up and said something specific because that's how charlatans work. And so anyway, these nutty ideas are consistently worse than mainstream macro despite all the weaknesses of mainstream macro. So stick with mainstream macro. Just don't think it's anything like a real science yet, settled science. Like macro is in its infancy, but it's better to be infancy in your infancy than to be like dead. <laughs> Okay, well, let me make a charitable case for some of these groups here. I, I agree that they have not been borne out in practice, nor do they always have good theory. Although I would say neo fisherians they, they do rely on a model. They do have some reason. And I, I think neo fisherians There's a model. We know why it's wrong. Well, I, I would say neo fisherians confuse the long run for the short run because yes. the relationship, it's a Fisher relationship, as the name implies. But the MMTs, I mean, they are really a, a subset of post-Keynesian economics. They're a cartoon version of post-Keynesian economics. Okay, well, I'm just saying post-Keynesian economics, you can find some reasonable people who make 
arguments. And I want to I want to mention one. Mark, I think it's Mark Lavoie, he came on the podcast and we talked about, for example, Paul Volcker's disinflation and, and, and the recession he created to bring inflation down. And, you know, he said, look, I would have preferred price controls over jacking up interest rates to double digits like Paul Volcker did. And I said, well, OK, but don't we have evidence that price controls don't always work out so well? And he was honest. He goes, yes, you're right. They can cause distortions and cause problems. But I want to err on the side of price controls. He believed they were less harmful. But at least he was you know, open, transparent about it. You know, They come from a very different place. Post-Keynesians view inflation as a power struggle between capital and labor, whereas mainstream would view inflation, you know, demand and supply <laughs> kind of driven by spending or whatever it may be. There are people, now I, I guess with MMT, I believe one thing that maybe really undermined their credibility is that when we had this high inflation, no one acknowledged this is what they had been talking about, that inflation was the real constraint, if you recall. That's one of the th- claims they made. When we had this inflation, then they weren't ready to say, okay, now it's time to start tightening policy. Some of the MMTers also have, I think, a good understanding of how the plumbing of the monetary policy system works. But your point is, these ideas have been tested and they have not worked out in practice. Well, right. So I think with ideas like price controls, you know, that's not obviously nutty because you see some cases where we've done price controls and it didn't blow up the economy. Right. World War II. World War II. And it's not nutty on its face either because like, so MMT, you know, it's nutty because when you ask them to tell you the model, they never will. You know, you can't find the model. Price controls, the rationale for price controls is very simple. It doesn't depend on the model. And, you know, it's like, it's pretty straightforward, you know, stop raising prices because I tell you to. And you can point to some examples where this was done and it's not obviously nutty. I think that in general, it's a pretty bad way to control inflation and that it has extreme dangerous downsides and relatively little upside if you look at how well it's actually done. So I think it's a bad idea, but I don't think it's it's a nutty idea. So I think there's a difference between bad and nutty. And any physicist is able to tell the idea between a physics theory that's wrong and a physics theory that's gibberish. And so People in the economic sphere need to be able to tell the difference between a theory that's wrong and a theory that's gibberish. And I think that MMT and praxeology are gibberish, whereas the idea of you know price controls and a lot of these things are, are not. So they need to come up with a formal model in order for it to be falsifiable, to be checked. And it doesn't have to be like a math model. You don't have to write equations. But you have to say like, okay, my theory of how the economy works says if this happens, then that happens. If you do this, then that happens. Some way for you to evaluate and test. Even in a heuristic, even in a non-quantitative way, but just a directional way of like, I did this and inflation went down. You don't have to predict that it went down by 3.3752 points or whatever, but you'd have to say like, yes, when we do this, inflation goes down. And to a certain extent, we're working off a similar alchemy with fiscal stimulus. We don't exactly know how fiscal stimulus works. We just observe that there appears to be a Keynesian multiplier, especially in deep recessions. We don't know how it works yet. It is alchemy. We have models of the zero lower bound. Those models are almost certainly misspecified at the micro level. It's alchemy. And so price controls to the extent that they work or don't work are are another form of alchemy. And macroeconomics isn't a real science yet. Still alchemy. That's okay because, you know, you can't pretend, right? You shouldn't you shouldn't pretend to be more scientific than you are. It's okay to not know things yet, right? And there's many things we just don't know yet about the, the world. But when you see people like MMT or, or the praxeology people, when you see these people, they claim to already know everything. They have an immaculate theory that has solved everything. An immaculate theory which we cannot you know, relate the particulars of at this exact time, but trust us, it always works every time exactly because based on accounting identities or undeniable axioms about human action, right? It's based on these like absolute truth never fails. That's gibberish. That's nonsense. And that's very different than saying like price controls will reduce inflation. That's something you can test by doing some price controls. It's a testable theory. Okay. Testable. Let us remain anchored to reality instead of pretending right, right. that we know everything. This has been great, Noah. We're going to have to wrap it up. But our friend from the days of of blogging, Nick Rowe, he attempted to re-engineer the ISLM to make an MMT model out of it. So for those who are interested in in an attempt by a non-MMTer to formalize the MMT view, you can go check his work out. In fact, we'll provide a link to that. He basically redid the ISLM and MMT view. So at least someone is trying to give them a model. Well, Noah, thank you again for coming on the show, spending the extra time with us, and we appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate having me on. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. 
Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.